Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are talking today about GI drugs and antihistamines. This is recording part one. <clears throat> First, a review of what histamine is. It's a naturally occurring amine, which mediates inflammation, as we see in allergic reactions. It is secreted from two particular kinds of cells, mast cells, which are found in the skin, the lungs, and the GI tract, and basophils, which are present in the circulation. The histamine receptors are divided into subcategories. The H1 receptor I think of as the allergy receptor. It's involved in contraction of smooth muscle in the respiratory and GI systems. Stimulation of this receptor leads to pruritus or itching and sneezing, release of nitric oxide which causes peripheral vasodilation, also decreased conduction through the AV node which could lead to bradycardia or coronary vasoconstriction. The H2 receptor I think of as the GI receptor. When it's stimulated, it leads to secretion of gastric ions, uh, hydrogen ions, also increased myocardial contractility and heart rate and coronary vasodilation. There is an H3 receptor. I think of it as a negative feedback receptor. When it's stimulated, it inhibits further synthesis and release of histamine. May also have some overlap with the H2 receptor. So if a patient gets an H2 blocker that also blocks H3, then what you may actually have happening is increased synthesis of histamine. That would be dangerous if a patient also had a drug that evokes histamine release. So overall, what are the clinical things we see when patients have histamine on board? We see a lot of flushing and hypotension, decreased SVR, capillary permeability, and all of this leads to edema. On the whole, we see positive inotropic and chronotropic effects, maybe with some dysrhythmias. In the lungs, we see bronchoconstriction, especially in patients who have asthma or COPD, and increased production of nasal and bronchial mucus. There's constriction of intestinal smooth muscle, leading to increased bowel peristalsis and diarrhea, and increased gastric volume and gastric acidity. We often give histamine antagonists or antihistamines in order to relieve the effects of allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, pruritus, and urticaria, and to provide some protection against bronchospasm. Toxicity from these drugs looks a lot like anticholinergic poisoning. Patients may have seizures and also have cardiac dysrhythmias. The first drugs we'll talk about are H1 antagonists. These are selective, really just for the H1 receptor, with very little action at the H2 receptor. The first generation antihistamines were quite sedating and had significant effects on muscarinic, cholinergic, and serotonin receptors. The main side effects were somnolence with cognitive impairment and the anticholinergic effects. Once again, that would be dry mouth, tachycardia, and maybe some blurred vision, urinary retention, and impotence. A classic example of a first-generation H1 blocker would be diphenhydramine, or Benadryl, used for sedation as an antipyritic and antiemetic with a typical dose of 12.5 to 50 milligrams, either PO or IV, with a half-life of 3 to 9 hours. Benadryl is used to block histamine-mediated vasodilation during an anaphylactic reaction, and it comes with significant sedation and lots of anticholinergic side effects. A few other first-generation drugs you might be familiar with are chlorpheniramine or chlortrimeton, bromphenyramine or dimetap. They tend to have less anticholinergic side effects and even can have some paradoxical CNS stimulation. Also hydroxyzine or Vistaril, which is used for sedation or anxiety as well as motion sickness, vertigo, nausea, and vomiting. It has quite a lot of anticholinergic effects. The second generation H1 antagonists are non-sedating, probably because they don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So we don't see a lot of effect at muscarinic, cholinergic, or serotonin receptors. And these are drugs like loratadine, or claritin, and fexofenidine, or allegra. Now the H2 antagonists are primarily for their gastric effects. 
They're used in the treatment of GI ulceration, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and as a pre-anesthetic medication for these purposes. H2 antagonists inhibit the gastric uh, acid ion secretion. They may decrease gastric volume as well, with a duration of action of 6 to 10 hours. Some patients may have rebound hypersecretion of gastric acid after the drug wears off. Side effects of histamine antagonists include diarrhea, fatigue, and headache, and rarely cardiac dysrhythmias and mental status changes. Changes in gastric pH could alter the absorption of oral medications, so that's something to think about as we take or as we administer H2 antagonists, and chronic use could actually increase susceptibility to systemic infection by changing the pH of the GI system. The original H2 antagonist, or one of the early ones anyway, was cimetidine or tagamet. Unfortunately, it had a lot of drug interactions due to its binding to cytochrome P450, leading to increased plasma levels of many different drugs. Nowadays, you're more likely to see ranitidine or Zantac and famotidine or Pepsid, which have very little in the way of side effects or drug interactions and don't interact with the P450 system. Ranitidine is dosed at 50 mg IV, famotidine at 20 mg IV. They last for a few hours um, in the body, although clinically their effects persist for about 12 hours. So having talked about H2 antagonists, it makes sense to transition now and talk about another GI drug, and that would be proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs. These drugs inhibit the pump that transfers protons from the gastric parietal cells into the uh, stomach. These may decrease gastric fluid volume as well, although the degree to which that happens is debated. But their primary goal is to change acidity. There are many drugs in this category, including omeprazole or Prilosec, esomeprazole, Nexium, Lansoprazole, Prevacid, and Pantoprazole or Protonix. Protonix is the one that's available in IV formulation. And it's said that 40 mg of Pantoprazole plus 50 mg of Ranitidine, both given IV, could increase your gastric pH within an hour. Otherwise, these drugs taken orally require at least two to six hours for their effect to begin. Antacids are usually salts of a metal like magnesium, aluminum, or calcium. They neutralize gastric acid content and have no significant effect on gastric volume. A disadvantage of these drugs is that they may be considered a violation of NPO guidelines because they are particulate antacids and they don't form a clear liquid once they're chewed and swallowed. There are many different kinds, like sodium bicarbonate, which is an Alka-Seltzer, magnesium hydroxide, which is milk of magnesia, aluminum hydroxide, which is Mylanta, and then mixtures like Rolaids or Maalox. Each of these carries its own side effects, mostly related to the salt that's being administered, whether it's sodium, magnesium, aluminum, and patients with renal failure should take these drugs with caution. There is a non-particulate or a clear antacid, and that would be bicitra, which is a mixture of sodium citrate and citric acid. You may see this being used in the OB setting or other full stomach situations where we want to increase gastric pH rapidly. It does have an unpleasant flavor, and it comes as a liquid that the patient drinks. Taking sodium bicitrate can lower the mortality due to acid pneumonitis when a patient regurgitates and then aspirates into their lungs. That would be because we have increased the pH. Now the two variables that improve mortality are higher pH and smaller volume of aspirate. Well, when we drink an ounce of fluid, we may be increasing gastric volume, not decreasing it. But because we've increased the pH, we may see a benefit. Furthermore, since it's a non-particulate antacid, we have less likelihood of a foreign body reaction and a faster onset of action compared to a chewed antacid like Rolaids or Tums. Metaclopramide, or Reglan, is a medication that 
binds to or sensitizes cholinergic, specifically muscarinic receptors in the GI system. This will stimulate upper GI motility and accelerate clearance of the stomach and decrease gastric volume. We see this used in patients who have a full stomach, including traumas, obese patients, parturients, and patients with GERD. It's less likely to reverse opioid-induced gastric dysmotility, dysmotility. It also has a role in treating patients who have diabetic gastroparesis. If you give 10 to 20 milligrams IV over three minutes, 15 to 30 minutes before induction of anesthesia, you may be able to speed up gastric emptying. However, if it's given rapidly, patients may develop cramping, and its effects may be offset by the use of atropine. Metaclopramide will increase lower esophageal sphincter tone and has no significant effect on gastric pH. Metaclopramide is also a dopamine antagonist, even though dopamine is not the primary mechanism of its action. This may help explain why it has an antiemetic effect from binding the dopamine receptors in the CTZ, although, as we'll see later, it's really not a first-line agent for treatment of postoperative nausea and vomiting. Patients can get dystonic extrapyramidal side effects and akathisia from metaclopramide, especially with long-term use, and it should not be used in patients with Parkinson's disease because it can worsen their symptoms by being a dopamine antagonist. Other side effects include hypotension, dysrhythmias, dysphoria, and sedation. I have seen the dysphoria, and you may want to consider administering a benzodiazepine first if you give it to an awake patient. It should be avoided in patients who have seizures or, or who take MAOIs or TCAs. And in theory, it can inhibit plasma cholinesterase activity, having an impact on succinylcholine or ester local anesthetics. Finally, erythromycin, which is an antibiotic, has an effect of increasing lower esophageal sphincter tone and promoting GI motility. In fact, some people use it to treat diabetic gastroparesis and increase gastric emptying. We'll stop here. Let me know if you have any questions, and we'll continue in the next recording.